Grace and peace to you from my Lord Jesus Christ. This week we turn our attention to the holiness and Pentecostal traditions. It's important to remember the links here. We have Roman Catholicism in the, in the Western tradition. Anglicanism arises out of Roman Catholicism. Wesleyanism or Methodism arises out of Anglicanism. And the holiness movement arises out of the Wesleyan movement. And then the Pentecostal movement arises out of the holiness movement. So there is a decontinuity, uh, historical continuity between these traditions. And each is making a further contribution or emphasis or carving out a particular understanding of the faith um, for application and its setting. But there is a strong continuity here. And more specifically for this week, the continuity from Wesleyan to holiness to Pentecostal. And the key transition figure in that move from Wesleyan to holiness is Phoebe Palmer. And you're going to watch a video about her and learn more about her. But Phoebe Palmer was a Wesleyan, a Methodist, and believed in entire sanctification as Wesley taught it. And she sought it. She wanted that entire sanctification. She prayed for it. She um, used the means of grace that Wesley taught, of prayer, Bible study, church attendance, etc., etc., good works, to pursue that sanctification. But she never could achieve it. She never could realize it in her own life. And her own circumstances in life were tragic. Loss of her children, um, and her desire was so intense and so burning for, for that holiness that she emerges as the mother of the holiness movement. You'll hear more of that story from the video, but the key book is the book called The Way of Holiness, written in 1845. And her way of holiness is, is going to um, forge a difference between Wesleyanism and the holiness movement. Because where in Wesley, the entire sanctification is kind of a process, and we'll talk more about the differences here in a moment. Phoebe Palmer came to the conclusion that Holiness was something that you lay claim to based upon the promise of God. You name it and you claim it. You've heard that language before. That's holiness language. And it comes out of Phoebe Palmer. In fact, her three steps to entire sanctification, three steps to uh, the life of holiness. The first step is consecration where you lay everything on the altar to Christ. You, you give it all over to Jesus. You put it all on the altar. You've heard that language probably as well in the American context. You put it all on the altar. That's holiness language from Phoebe Palmer. And so we present our whole selves as an as a act of consecration to God. Then the second step is we trust that God accepts our sacrifice. And we trust then that God has fully sanctified us, whether we feel it inwardly or not. We claim what God has promised. And so whatever touches the altar is holy. God has sanctified you. Believe it. Consecrate yourself. Believe that God has sanctified you. And now go bear witness to that gift of sanctification. So you testify to holiness and encourage others to seek it. And so the call to holiness becomes revivalistic. Not only is there a call to salvation or a call to conversion, right? Now there's a call to holiness, which is the second step, you might say, the second aspect of salvation. We are justified and we're saved by faith, 
But now to seek holiness is sanctification, and we want to seek entire sanctification, or Christian perfection, as Wesley called it. We seek that. How do we seek it? Well, Wesley said you seek it through the means of grace. Phoebe says you claim it. Not so much seek it, but claim it and believe it in the light of your consecration to God. God will give it. And so revivalism takes on the form not only of calling sinners to justification and conversion to Christ, but now calling those who have been converted to holiness, to full holiness or entire sanctification. So here's a, the whole movement began out of this. So by 1885 and even before, you have holiness conferences and holiness uh, conventions and holiness camp meetings. And you have a holiness assemblies and extra congregational organizations, parachurch organizations that are holiness in character. And one of the most important statements of this uh, comes in the General Holiness Assembly of 1885, where they say, entire sanctification is a second definite work of grace wrought by the baptism with the Holy Spirit in the heart of the believer subsequent to regeneration, received instantaneously by faith by which the heart is cleansed from all corruption and filled with the perfect love of God. You see the two stages. There is regeneration, which is conversion, justification. But then there's the second work of God, sanctification, which is holiness. And God gifts us with holiness instantaneously, cleansing us from corruption so that in Christian perfection, doesn't mean we don't ever sin or we don't make mistakes, but what it does mean in Wesleyan version and then in the holiness you know, there are different versions of this, but different ways of saying it. But uh, it ultimately means uh, no deliberate sin, no willful sin, that we're prefer perfect in that sense. And we, never, we don't claim to be sinners anymore. We are no longer sinners. We have been perfected by God. We're perfected, and the love of God is perfected in our heart. And we are not sinners. We are saints. We are holy you might hear this in some quarters like um, on one occasion I, I was giving a little talk and, and I said, uh, you know, I'm a, a reformed sinner or I'm a sinner and a saint. And that's, that's language that holiness traditions don't use. They don't think of themselves as sinners anymore. They are saints. Sinners is gone. The sin is gone. The corruption has gone. And now we live in this perfection by the love of God and by the grace of God uh, that God has given it to us in our hearts. Now, I think it's helpful to see a contrast between Wesley and Palmer regarding entire sanctification. For Wesley, this was an inward experience, and for Phoebe Palmer as well. But Phoebe Palmer identified that inward experience as the baptism of the Holy Spirit that one receives subsequent to regeneration, subsequent to uh, justification. And so for Wesley, it's an inner transformation, whereas for Phoebe Palmer, it's power for ministry. God sanctifies you so you can go witness. God sanctifies you so you can go minister. For Wesley, it's usually a, a, a matter of growth and maturation. It's not necessarily instantaneous, it, though it can be for Wesley. Wesley is very ambiguous about the timing. Uh, he even thinks that you might uh, that you might spend your whole life waiting in faith, and maybe get it just before your death. Uh, but for Phoebe, this is something you claim now, and it happens instantaneously. It's a what Phoebe called the shorter way. Her three steps are the shorter way uh, to holiness. The goal or the chronology is that that the uh, Christian perfection is the goal of the Christian life for Wesley, but for Phoebe, it's the beginning, the beginning of a life of ministry and witness. Uh, sacraments, for Wesley, sacraments, means of grace, um, the Lord's Supper, for example, Eucharist, Wesley said he 
Uh, he does it four times a week and would like to do it more often. But it's, it's the, the grace that comes through the sacraments is a way of feeding and nourishing and nurturing this growth and sanctification. But in the holiness movement, the Eucharist doesn't have much of a holiness function. We, we get into our sanctification directly by faith, um, we, by claiming it. And there, are, there is no role for sacrament. That's part of the revivalistic dimension of this. There's no role for sacrament other than the sacrament of prayer by which we consecrate and claim the promise and God then gives it. For Wesley, this was an inner witness sort of thing, an experience of the Spirit. For, for Phoebe, it's the objective assurance of the Word. God said, I'm going to give it to you. God has promised it in the Word. I claim it, therefore, it's an actuality. I just need to believe it and bear witness to it. The context for Wesley is kind of ecclesial. It's in the church. It's through the means of grace of the church and through Christian life and Christian community. What happens in the holiness movement is this becomes a matter of revival. Not just revival in terms of conversions, but revival in terms of holiness. So very often in the 19th century, you would have camp meetings that were revivalistic one week. And then the second week, I mean, first week, they would be converting revivals, converting revivals. Then in the second week, you would have holiness revivals. And that was a very common practice uh, in the 19th century. Necessity. For Wesley, you expected it by the end of your life. But it wasn't like, okay... Uh, you need to get this sometime in your life so you can be assured. For Phoebe, this was necessary for going to heaven. You, one had to move into this life of holiness, of entire sanctification, in order to have assurance of heaven itself. So you can see the difference that emerges here between the Wesleyan tradition and the holiness tradition. And now, in the late 19th century, these two traditions are uh, parallel. They are separate traditions for the most part. Although there's a lot of overlap, they do have separate trajectories. The Wesleyan tradition becomes the, is, in fact, the Methodist tradition primarily. But the, West, the holiness tradition emerges in new denominations, like the Nazarene Church, for example, is an expression of the holiness tradition. Now, what happens is that the holiness tradition, uh, emphasizing the baptism of the Holy Spirit as this second work of grace, the entire sanctification, um, Pentecostals will, will experience a, a new reality, a, a new beginning, uh, the, the latter reign of God, the, the, the blessings of God as God pours out the Spirit once again upon the world. And Pentecostalism is going to arise out of this holiness tradition. Whereas um, uh, for holiness Pentecostals, the um, entire sanctification is something that is expected that empowers for ministry. But for Holiness Pentecostals, now this, this entire sanctification or this um, empowerment for ministry is going to be evidenced in the supernatural work of the Spirit. In other words, speaking in tongues or maybe some other manifestation, but primarily speaking in tongues from the beginning. And so Holiness Pentecostal denominations like Church of God in Christ or the Church of God in Cleveland, the Holiness Pentecostals are going to be um, going to find or going to agree with or, or uh, promote entire sanctification, Wesleyan holiness, but in a Phoebean manner, empowerment for ministry, and with supernatural evidence of its gift, that is, a gift of the Spirit if not speaking in tongues, something else, but primarily speaking in tongues. But there were other Pentecostals who didn't come out of the holiness tradition. And they didn't have this uh, sense of holiness that we have in the holiness movement. 
but they may have been Wesleyans or they may have been um, Baptist or they may have been others uh, from other traditions who had an experience of the Spirit in a Pentecostal manner. And so you have the non-holiness Pentecostals, that is, finished work Pentecostals, which are more taking a reformed view of sanctification as a process, a process of maturation that takes time, that we struggle with sin, and we're always saint and sinner, as Luther said. Um, but the finished work um, is sanctification, is that, is that Christ is going to work that. Right? So it empowers for ministry, but it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit empowers for ministry. But there's also the supernatural evidence of it. So you have these non-Wesleyan, non-holiness Pentecostals, or more Wesleyan Pentecostals, but not holiness Pentecostals. And those traditions like the Foursquare Gospel Church or the Assemblies of God reflect those traditions. So you have holiness Pentecostals and non-holiness Pentecostals. But what they have in common is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced in a supernatural work or supernatural gift like speaking in tongues. The Pentecostal movement came or has come basically in three waves, typically how it's described. So this is not new to me. I'm sharing with you what scholars typically think about this in terms of Pentecostal movement. The first wave is what we might call the classic Pentecostalism, it arising out of the holiness movement, identifying the baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. And this, in the first uh, half of the 20th century, created numerous Pentecostal denominations. The second wave is the charismatic movement which in the 1950s, 1960s, 70s um, saw the, the presence of the Spirit in evidence by speaking in tongues uh, arriving or being poured out upon denominations other than Pentecostals like Catholic Charismatics and Baptist Charismatics and Presbyterian Charismatics and Methodist Charismatics. Um, and that movement uh, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, for example, is an example of that where people from different denominations would come together and they would gather and they would experience the Spirit and, and they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But they wouldn't create a new denomination. What they would do is they'd go back to their traditions, Catholic, Baptist, Churches of Christ, or whatever, and, and spread the word, you might say, or at least remain Catholic but also have a charismatic uh, aspect to their faith. And that became very common in the 60s and 70s. The third wave is sometimes called neo-charismatic or the signs and wonders movement, which uh, John Wimber would be one of the leading uh, edges of that in the 1980s. The vineyard movement arose out of the third wave. But the emphasis is not so much on speaking in tongues as it is the experience of the Spirit in diverse ways, including supernatural art miracles, speaking in tongues, prophecy, uh, and expressions of the Spirit like holy laughter and other dimensions of the Spirit. In other words, the third wave uh, honors the Pentecostal movement but recognizes, uh, as they see it, uh, a wider experience of the Spirit and a wider expression of the Spirit than just um, some particular gifts or a particular way of thinking about uh, what Pentecostalism might mean. And so the Vineyard Movement is a uh, low-key, you might say, in terms of its Pentecostalism, but it is nevertheless a witness to the experience of the Spirit in diverse ways, including supernatural realities, particularly healings, tongue speaking, prophecy, um, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discernment. All of those are a part of, uh, of a constellation 
of experiences that are a part of the third wave and expressed in different ways. And it and again, it, it overflows into from multiple denominations. It's not just identified with the vineyard movement or only the vineyard movement or, or any particular denomination. Well, I hope you enjoy your reading this week. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.